Welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network's live 2020 election coverage, focusing on what organized labor is doing throughout the United States to ensure all votes are counted and labor's voice is heard. Reporting will be based on contributions from our national network of members. The views expressed do not represent official positions of the network. The Labor Radio Podcast Network has over 70 labor-focused shows in four countries and serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. You can follow the conversation with the hashtag Labor Radio Pod, where we are broadcasting working people's voices 24 hours a day. And welcome back to the Labor Radio Podcast Network's Election 2020 live stream coverage. Thank you so much for joining us. Things are getting real now here, working people. It is 7 o'clock Eastern, which means that polls in Florida, Georgia, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Vermont, and Virginia have closed as the AFL-CIO is putting out on its Twitter feed right now. If you are in line in any of those states, stay in line. You have the right to vote. 
I'm Harold Phillips. I am the host of Working to Live in Southwest Washington, and I am joined by members of the Labor Radio Podcast Network and affiliation of labor broadcasters and podcasters from around the country who are here to bring you election news and results from a working person's perspective. And I want to ask you all to introduce yourself. Um, let's start off with our executive producer and the man at Master Control, Evan. Hello, hello. Thank you, Harold. And welcome everyone who's tuning in to our 2020 election live stream focusing on labor. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer of Empathy Media Lab, focusing on labor, political economy, art, and culture. And Jeremy. Jeremy Waugh, host of the Break Time Breakdown out of Louisville, Kentucky. We are affiliated with the Sheet Metal Workers Local 110 and Smart, uh, Smart Unions, Sheet Metal Air Rail and Transportation Workers. And we are going to head back to the Beltway area. Alan, please introduce yourself to these fine people. Thank you, Harold. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Weirdak. I'm a co-producer of the Labor History Today podcast and the producer of the Cool Things in the Meanie Archive podcast. Um, coming to you from Olney, Maryland and Montgomery County, just outside of D.C. And to the west of Allen, but not nearly so west as I am out here in Washington State, Mr. Gene Lance. I'm Gene Lance. I, uh, my radio program is called The Workers Beat. It's on knon.org all over the world. It's a talk show at 9 o'clock every Saturday. I'm also the communications director for the Dallas AFL-CIO, and I'm the secretary of the Texas Alliance for Retired Americans. So I'm speaking to you about Texans. And I'm speaking to you about older people, and I, all of us are speaking about workers. It's a historic event to have worker coverage of an election. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate what Gene just said. This is what the Labor Radio Podcast Network is all about. There are over 70 shows in the network, and they span the gamut. Is a gamut spanned? They run a, the gamut between official shows from union organization like Jeremy's uh, from a specific union local to broad labor oriented shows to history shows like uh, cool things from the Meany archive. The fact that we've brought all these people together in one place to talk about the election from a worker's perspective is kind of a historic thing. So it's really great to have the worker's voice here talking about these issues. Um, Jeremy, you just uh, shared something in the chat there from down there in Kentucky. Um, I'm a little confused by it. Could you tell the audience what you're talking about there? Uh, yeah, like clockwork. So the polls are closed. It's uh, 7.09 and they called Kentucky for Donald Trump. Um, it's typically how it goes. I'm surprised that it took till 16% reported for them to call it. Um, but usually that's how it works, man. Polls close and, and they're already calling it for the Republican. It's just the way Kentucky goes. Well, so how does mail-in voting work in Kentucky? Because I know every state has different laws. Some places they weren't allowed to start counting the mail-in votes before election day. Some places in the country have actually said they're not going to start counting mail-in votes until the day after election day. Do you guys have absentee and mail-in voting down there, right? Yeah, and it was actually, it was expanded this year because of the pandemic. It was expanded where they allowed uh, COVID-19 to be an excuse for uh, requesting a mail-in ballot. Uh, and there was a, a huge um, mail-in and er early voting um, took place. It was, uh, I believe it was, they reported one point, almost 1.4 million people voted mail-in or early in person uh, out of a 3.5 million total registered voters in the state. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, I, I don't fully understand how they do it. I mean, but like I said, normally it's, they'll, they'll be reporting like 2% and have it called already. So the fact that it took till 16 and I was celebrating a, a moment of blue uh, on the map 
um, it, it was a it was a short lived small victory. And uh, somebody just asked if there were any numbers on McConnell. He is up um, by five percent right now, which um, not not too bad. That's not too bad uh, for Amy. Well, yeah, with only sixteen percent of the votes counted, five um, percent is not a lot, is it? Well, right. So just to compare, so uh, Amy's down by five percent. Uh, Joe Biden is down by. 13 percent so mm. i mean it's it's significant you know what i'm saying um yeah what i what i wonder here is if is if this is going to be the first sign of things to come where um trump and republicans are going to start calling the results um when we're only at 15 to 20 percent reporting mm, no just to be clear like this is pretty standard pro protocol for the state Okay. I mean, we're typically in just like just like this year is no different. We're usually the first to to call it as soon as polls close. It's uh, they're saying Kentucky for Republican, and polls are now officially closed. <laughs> <laughs> Who don't want? <laughs> yeah. Well, so as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, polls are closing in a lot of different places. But the AFL-CIO is telling people that if you are in one of these states where the polls are closing, stay in line. You still have the right to vote if you are in line. So as we said earlier in the show, this is going to be a long night, folks. Not everybody is going to call their results as fast as apparently Kentucky no. does. No. And the fact that Kentucky may have gone for Trump in the presidential election certainly doesn't mean all of those elections have been called. There's a lot more offices being run for in Kentucky, right, Jeremy? Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, uh, House seats and uh, one in particular Senate race still going on. So it'll be, uh, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be, real happy with a long night in that Senate race. Yeah. <laughs> Are there particular statewide elections that you guys at Smart Local 110 have been working hard on? Uh, a bunch, a bunch, man. We, so the last, uh, the last presidential election back in 2016, uh, our state government, our state house and Senate flipped and the Republicans held a supermajority in both for the first time in over 100 years. And they came right to work after us. Uh, House Bill 1 was passing right to work. House Bill 3 was repealing prevailing wage. So they came out of the gates attacking uh, labor. Uh, so we're, um, I actually shared a video earlier. I don't know if we'll, we'll get to it or not, but uh, our state director of the, the building trades talked about that and and when we were when we were when i set up that interview when i was having an interview with him he had he was telling me uh, what he's concerned about is we're losing 10 pro-labor uh state legislators that um two of them uh, two of them lost their primary and eight of them are just not coming back they, they're you know they, they took on other positions or other jobs or whatever and um not returning, which who can blame them in this in this uh, landscape? But anyway, uh, what sucks is they were they were pretty stout supporters that we lost. So uh, some of the people that are running to take these spots, uh, even the Democrats, aren't particularly labor friendly. So uh, that's that was another hit. And and we have the uh, unemployment insurance is going to be on the docket for the next session especially if the republicans retain control which is is very likely and so they're, they're going to be looking to cut cut the benefit cut the uh, eligibility a lot of stuff that you know especially now during a pandemic is is the last thing that that they should be that they should be trying to do is to, is take money away from the working class but that's exactly what they're going to do Uh, Gene, you're muted, but I was actually just going to ask for your take on things. So uh, unmute and start over again, please. 
I have a statement from the Indiana uh, AFL-CIO from Twitter. Can I read that? Please, yeah, bring it on. It says, uh, as the polls close, the Indiana AFL-CIO celebrates record turnout and looks forward to every vote being counted. We're confident that in the hours and days to come, our voices will be heard and our votes will be counted using a process we have relied on for 200 years. And Indiana is another one that uh, they're already saying is skewing towards Trump. So um, I don't know if they necessarily pull the trigger as fast as they do down there in Kentucky, Jeremy, but uh, yeah, it is important. It, that it'll be close. All these votes counted. Yeah, it'll be close. And, and I'm, I, I'm sure, I'm sure the votes will all be counted. I'm, I'm confident in that. Um, I'm pretty, I, I, I may have spoken to you all about this yesterday. I don't, I don't recall. It was yesterday. It's kind of a blur, but uh, we, we, we've got a, we've got a Republican secretary of state. He's serving his first term, but he's done some, some positive things when it comes to elections and how we run our elections here and the things that, that they've, the, the way they've opened it up and stuff. Uh, he's worked with our Democratic newly elected governor to make this happen. So it was, it's been really, that's been the highlight of all this for me is watching uh, two sides of the aisle come together, come up with a plan, a joint plan and implement it for the good of the, the, the state. And um, so, th so that's been really cool. And, and, and I've, I'm pretty confident that there isn't any kind of funny business going on. And like I said, the fact that like normally they're calling it at like one or 2%, you know, um, and so this, this time they waited till 16%. Uh, it sounds funny, but I mean, that's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah, no, I think that's an important thing to realize, um, especially in a place like Kentucky where they had a six o'clock close. That was the first close, but then also there was kind of a buffer into seven. So ob obviously they, they took some time to be sure that they're gonna get it right. Now, Gene, um, in Texas where you're at your polls close here in about 45 minutes at seven o'clock is that right that is correct uh it's 6 18 here in central time i just saw on twitter that uh is it vermont and virginia were called for biden by fox news well okay <laughs> Uh, it's 2020. I don't think we should uh, necessarily be surprised by anything at this point, but it's kind of amazing to me again that uh, that these organizations are calling these races this quickly um, because of the mail-in vote, but it's possible that they may have started counting the mail-in vote before the polls actually closed. I know that that's how it works here in the 100% vote by mail states of Oregon and Washington. They started counting when the ballots started coming in. So when our polls close, they'll actually have a lot of the count already done. Um, it may very well be the same in those states. Well, that, and that was something that we were, we were um, advised to pay attention to is uh, some of the some of the states, I guess, at the eight o'clock hour, the states that, that polls close around eight o'clock, um, the, they're already they've been counting their mail-in and early votes. They've been processing them already previously, so you might start seeing a lot of, um, like, I, I'm looking at Georgia right now. I think that was one of them where they they started processing that early vote er, early, like before today, and so you might see. They said, you know, if you see. Uh, Joe Biden jump out to like have 400,000 votes to 10,000. Don't get excited because they'll process the, the, all the early votes first before they start reporting the, the day of votes. So it'll be, uh, I think Florida is the same way too. So you'll see like maybe Joe has a big lead, but it'll start getting chipped away at, uh, you know, as the night goes on. So something to be aware of. I gave us a little bit of wrong information a while ago when I said that the polls in Texas all close at seven o'clock central time. Uh, the truth is we are in two different time zones. It's 1,500 miles across Texas. And so uh, El Paso results won't even start until uh, seven o'clock mountain time. 
seven o'clock mountain time. And everybody keeps saying, everybody from the AFL-CIO keeps saying, don't take these early returns too seriously because it may be Saturday before we know how this election comes out. Well, and I think it's an important thing for everybody to remember that this is the way elections have always worked. We have the vote count. The news organizations do their magic where they look at the number of ballots that are out versus the ones that are reported. When they reach a certain threshold, then they say, okay, there's no way that this person can have more ballots than are out. So we're going to call it for this person, but then it's still got to be certified. And that certification process can take days. So and yeah, this that, is, they don't always get it right. I look at Bush in Florida. There we go. So um, Evan, why don't you go ahead and um, bring up that video that we talked about. We're going to take a look at some other results and we'll be back with you in just a few minutes. And just before playing it, I want to introduce it as one of our uh, Labor Radio Podcast Network members, uh, Radio Labor from Mark Lange uh, in Canada. So here I go. A daily labor podcast. Hello, I'm Mark Belanger from Radio Labor. It's important to remember our past, but only because it helps us face the present to make the future, and the future is always coming. Here's Benny Esguera and gang with Solidarity Forever, the new millennium version. Uh, no more division, no, we're bringing a new vision, and it's just in time for matches. We give birth a new tradition, solidarity forever with a new millennium flavor. Now we're resurrecting it, one century later, keep our feet fixed on the past. In order to stay rooted in our minds, eye on tomorrow, so that today we get through this, so that one day we're victorious. So just gather now, come here. Divisions are created by those who doubt and fear. We give thanks to all the workers who put it all on the line, those who took it to the streets, moving crowds with conscious minds, those who gave their lives. Give thanks to those who made lost lives, only work for those who make them not break them be patient the best way to protect your rights is by always knowing your rights without our brain and muscle not a single wheel can turn so put your hands together all under one umbrella it's time for unity solidarity forever ah. never seen to help the people prosper your money's being hoarded and the people are unsupported social welfare's been aborted labor crimes go unreported when we try to fight back it seems we can't afford it we try to be united but they're implementing laws that are keeping us divided they're commodifying labor then they're bidding for the lowest they're thinking that it's clever but we know we're something better solidarity forever now jobs are disappearing and all we're ever hearing is pay a lot more get paid a little less work a little harder than work a little longer but we're taking it no longer we're decided we're uniting cause together we are stronger the unions got a back cbas protections better wages a fact so we're making our choice and we're making some noise we're walking with boys and we're raising our voice we're singing <laughs> The new millennium version of Solidarity Forever was produced by the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, the UFCW. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about caring for each other through global solidarity. All right, that was a good way to keep our blood pumping on what is probably going to be 
a long night of looking at results and interpreting results and trying not to drink too much as the results come in, wondering what they mean. Let's welcome back Chris Garlock to the panel. Chris, um, everybody else introduced themselves at the top of the hour, but you weren't here. Who the heck are you? Who am I? Good question. Uh, last I checked, uh, I do the Union City Radio uh, show out of Washington, D.C. That's uh, five minutes during drive time on WPFW, the uh, Pacifica station. I also host uh, Your Rights at Work, which is a weekly uh, worker rights call-in show uh, about uh, the rights you have, the rights you don't have, the rights you wish you had. So it's, uh, oh look, and we did get Danny Schur in. All right. <laughs> We had, to, we had to pull some strings to make that happen. Um, so we're all, we're all set on that. Th that video, by the way, the radio labor folks are just so amazing. I, I, I will admit I shamelessly use their stuff um, <clears throat> on all my shows, all my shows. They've got everything. They've got news. They've got global news. Uh, they've even got uh, music. They've got Canadian labor history. It's just a fabulous show. Hey, so uh, Danny, thank you for joining us. And I do want to uh, get over to you and talk about some of the news coming out from these poll closings. But uh, Evan, you wanted to talk about a time long ago, long, long ago. I mean, I realize January 2020 feels like 40 years ago at this point, but you're talking about literally four years ago, right? Yeah, when I had hair and, you know, I looked 20 <laughs> years younger. I mean, it, it's been a long time, very long four years. Um, I think where you were when you found out that Trump won. And I think that's a funny kind of story. And uh, I don't know if we have just a little bit of time. Harold, where were you when uh, you found out that Trump had won? Do you remember or were you drunk? Uh, both, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um Actually, I will tell you that uh, election night 2016 is the first time that I threw up in about 15 years and has been the last time that I threw up. Um, and it wasn't just the liquor. Uh, as things started edging towards Trump, my wife just kind of went to bed in disgust and I was glued to the TV watching all the coverage checking the stats on the Twitter and everything else. And when it became evident, there was nothing to be done. And I just pretty much lost it, but uh, made it to the, made it to the porcelain throne for that. So can be thankful for that at least. And that definitely comes under the uh, too much information. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if we're going to be honest, if we're going to be a big labor family, I just, I just want to put it all out there, but not like that. <laughs> <clears throat> you, well, you asked Evan, so you know Harold's Har Har Harold's that you know he's an honest kind of a guy. What, what about you, Garlock? What, where, where were you at 2016? You know, I was at the AFL CIO uh, uh, building. We were watching the returns, and uh, you know, as you know, it was it was pretty clear, you know, when Florida went, and then when Pennsylvania went, which way things were going. And I looked around the room and realized the only people left in the room were all these really young staffers, young labor folks. And I realized another thing, which is that, you know, I've been through the Reagan wins. I've, you know, I've, been, I've been around for a minute. I've, I've been through some of these nights. And I thought, that's, this is, if you haven't been through one of these, if this is your first one, it's tough. So uh, I, I, Lisa was with me. Lisa, Lisa was like your wife. She couldn't take it. She, she took the car. She went home. And I just hung out. And, uh, you know, we had some right wingers that were taunting us and uh, <clears throat> just sort of, you know, counseled folks through. I didn't realize it was going to be four years of uh, sort of holding people's hands, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think it'll be a little bit different this time. That's, that's my hope. Otherwise, I'm going to need y'all to talk me off the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we've got some guests to welcome. Yes, we do. And uh, not only do we have Danny Schur, but we have uh, William Adig f joining the live stream. Not, not William from, Adig Zoom. Yeah, William Adig is joining the Zoom. He's, 
<laughs> that's Zoom's not Will's. Will, Zoom is not Will's last name. We didn't. We Tom Will's from the uh, Veterans Council and has uh, been on. Uh, I know he's been on my show a number of times. Will, I think you've been on pretty much every labor show in the country. I mean, you, you're a you're kind of. I'm, I'm making my rounds, and I, I kind of have. I don't really try to get on any radio shows. I. Uh, I feel when, when, when I need to have my voice on a radio show, especially talking about organized labor and talking about veterans, I'm going to be in that place and that's where I'm going to be at the right place. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those times I get a lot of, you know, why haven't I ever had you on the show before? It's like, because you didn't need to until now. And, and, and it's really cool to be on, uh, especially tonight. Um, it's been a long four years and I think that, uh, you're going to see democracy in America win out tonight. Um, and, and that's what I'm really excited about being on and talking about a little bit. Hey, where, where, where were you in, uh, in 16? Man, I was, uh, I was at my house. Uh, I went, went, well, it, I wasn't actually. It was, uh, I, I went home. It, usually I, I try to stay out a little later. Back then I, I stayed a little later. I was a zone lead in Southern Illinois. And uh, I was pretty worried for about two weeks going into it. Uh, my entire political career has watched uh, kind of Southern Illinois blue, blue, Demo blue dog Democrat uh, districts lose their background, you know, state reps, members of Congress. And I saw this kind of transformation happening. And it was kind of that I saw it happening pretty early on. And uh, I was at the only uh, same day registration spot. And I was watching the returns coming in early, looking at the line, which usually would be full of Democrats and from people from you know, places that, you know, outside, really outside the, you know, built up urban areas in, in my, my district. And started looking at all the rural districts with these massive margins, um, you know, 10 points higher than normal. And I realized pretty quick that it was, uh, it was going to be a long night. It wasn't going to be a fun night. Uh, before we, uh, we have a, actually a cool video uh, that we want to show, but before that, I just want to uh, reintroduce Danny. If you watched our stream last night, uh, you know Danny already. Uh, he is the, the brains and the talent behind a, a great film that um, it's going to be showing on December 1st, which is closer now than I realized, Danny. I mean, it's, it's coming up in just a few weeks. You look, you look fairly calm for a guy that's got a big, uh, a big premiere coming up in a few weeks. Uh, do you want to tell folks real quick about Stand? And then we have a video uh, from Will and a video from you. I don't know if we'll show them back to back, but uh, just uh, let folks know about your, your film. Uh, well, it's a film set against the 1919 Winnipeg general strike. And it's about solidarity, and although it's said 100 years ago, it's ripped from the headlines today. And just quickly, here's my Trump story. It wasn't from the night he was elected, but I'm meeting Richard Trumpka in the Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa the day after the inauguration. And Trumpka was late for the meeting because he was so bothered by having met Trump, and his head was going to explode <laughs> and i remember he said okay uh, i can't wrap my head about around this movie but go make it because we need a movie about hope that's my story that sounds like rich that does <laughs> oh wow cool all right so uh evan have we got uh will's video ready to will, will you're gonna love this and i'm not i'm not even gonna let you set up we're just gonna roll it and and i think you know what we're gonna do but we'll, we'll come back we'll talk about it in just a second all right Thanks, Marine. They'd buy me a cup of coffee, uh, even pick up the tab if I was sitting at a, a diner or something like that. And it made me proud every time. It was definitely a great thing, and, and I'm happy to everyone that's ever done that for me or anyone else in the armed services. Uh, but every single time that that happened, there was a little bit of a, a nagging thought in the back of my mind, because I come from a family with where my brother and sister are both teachers, my mom's a nurse, my uncle's a social worker, and every one of us is as dedicated to public service as everyone else. I believe the same thanks and recognition is due to those who work so hard in organized labor, in our schools, in our hospitals, on our construction sites, the cops and firemen who respond to emergencies every day, the utility workers who bail us out of these extreme weather events. Uh, and if I have anything to say, if I have the honor of serving as your next member of Congress, we will extend the same thank you and recognition, not just in words, but in actions. We will secure these rights and benefits that you have earned over the course of a lifetime of service to this country. That is not good. All right, so uh, why did we show that, Will? And that's a glimmer of hope, I think. Um, 
you know, for a lot of us, we, I, I came out to DC, you know, right after the election and um, people were pretty beat down. And I was uh, got given a program, started to try and develop this Union Veterans Council to, to utilize it as a way to, you know, create power for, for the labor movement, especially to over 1.2 million working veterans um, and the more than 3 million retiree veterans that were union members. Um, and, you know, you're trying to figure things out. The world was shook upside down on our heads. And I heard about this young Marine veteran running for Congress out in Western Pennsylvania, an area that we knew immediately that Trump wasn't going to be able to accomplish his goals and accomplish what he said. And, you know, it was a, it was an opportunity for a lot of people who were beat down to get out to Western Pennsylvania and elect this young member of Congress in a special election. And the district had been won by Trump by, I think, 30 points. So, you know, what that was, was a, a young person, you know, saying they were going to run an, an election the way they wanted to run an election. And, and fight back and, and people came out and they did that. And I think that that was a, a really big glimmer of hope for a lot of people in the labor community, especially because I, I was a member of Congress that when he, when he ran, he talked about organized labor and he talked about his service, but he also talked about everyone's service to their country. Um, and, and that's kind of really, you know, what, what I'm feeling tonight. Um, but that, that's a good clip and it, it goes back to a, to, to a time where we kind of put our feet down and said, you know, we're pointed in the right direction and we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Will. Hey, uh, uh, Danny, actually, there's a, there's a direct connection from, from Will and that clip to stand, which, which is really cool. But before we do that, uh, Jeremy, I'd love for you to introduce uh, our, our new guest. Um, where'd he go? I think he's there somewhere. I thought I saw him. All right. And then uh, that's just Gene. He changed his hat. Gene, don't do that, man. You had your Western hat on. Now you look like you're ready to. You know, okay. Paul, Paul was on for a moment. Uh, That's what I thought. That's what I was looking for. Was Paul? It seems like he must have dropped off. Ah, okay. So, so Paul's battling a a brand new computer that's like 12 years old or something. A brand new computer, 12 years old. Y'all got to get better stuff. But he no, he burned his computer out, and he so he, he's got his backup that's like <laughs> like 10 or 12 years old. I gotcha. So, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So. I what keep telling you, 2020, time has no meaning. A That's new right. computer can be 12 years old. This is That's just right. how this year works. Now you guys are just messing with my, or somebody's gotten into the bourbon. Paul okay. is back on, and we also can introduce David after Paul. All right, fine. Uh, so let me, let me have Danny make, I, I, I'm very pleased with myself with making the veterans conne connection. Danny, make that connection for us. So part of the story in 1919 was... Uh, veterans coming over from the First World War and returning to just a devastated economy, and specifically in the case of our story, but also all across the United States, returning to a labor market where the jobs that they occupied were occupied by others, which caused humongous friction. And when the Winnipeg general strike, about which stand is, blew up, it was this clash between largely anti-immigrant veterans and pro-strike veterans. Sound familiar, Will? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's been a little bit of a battle the last few years. And I, and I think that one thing that, that's really interesting about that, I think that after most of those major wars, we saw, you know, kind of both things happen. You know, veterans were targeted by every group and they, their, their leadership, their uh, community organizing ability, their skills. Um, and, you know, the progressive veterans hadn't really been very vocal for a long time. And I think that this election cycle, um, I mean, I remember just doing veteran stuff a few years ago and you, you barely see it at all. And, you know, this entire election cycle, we've seen progressive veterans and veterans just finally saying enough's enough. Like, you know, it's been actually really refreshing um, and, you know, even the polling showed that, but, you know, the organized labor and veterans, the history goes way, way back. Um, even back to the Civil War when, uh, you know, we had people coming back to the sit major cities after serving in the, in, the, in the Civil War and really founding some of the first major unions, um, using their organizational skills, using that time they spent together and coming back and, you know, doing, you know, doing, you know, organizing. But, you know, it, it is very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of, you know, there's never been a space for the veterans and, and labor. That's what's really interesting about what we're doing. 
We'll talk more about that, but uh, Jeremy, I see we do have Paul back. Do you want to introduce your colleague? Uh, sure. Joining us from the uh, international, the Smart International Association uh, and the uh, Director of Communication and Mobilization, Paul Pimentel. Good to, good to see you. Paul, you kind of look like you're in uh, uh, almost in witness protection. Yeah, <laughs> it's very, very strange here. <laughs> He's Good not at see liberty. He's in an undisclosed location. <laughs> no, he'll disclose it. He ain't afraid. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. yeah, thank so, you for having me on. Yeah, man. So, so Paul has actually been uh, the, the, the brainchild, sort of the, the, the main cog with the uh, mobilization effort with, throughout the international, right? With yep. the, uh, the text banking mainly and setting up the phone banking and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so if you want to just chime in on on what you've been seeing and your experiences and i know uh you got a long night ahead of you just like the rest of us but you're going to be doing it with the cameras off yeah yeah um yeah first of all i want to thank everybody for letting me be on here and talk for a little bit um from from, from what we saw you know here at smart we it started about four years ago after the election at smart for us and we kind of reconfigured our communications program uh, to make it more member centered, uh, instead of a top to bottom type of communication structure, it was more us hearing from members and responding to it rather than telling them what was best for them, um, or portraying that. And so we reconfigured things. The last couple of months have been, I can say very intense. We've had a very strong ground game. If you want to call it a ground game, a digital game where we've been reaching out to members just based on their personal preferences. Um, identifying members who vote a certain way, identifying members who, who are, are fans of the NRA, messaging them one way, messaging people the other way. And at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of grounding people down into their, into their union values. And um, I see Twitter has some results from Georgia. I just saw that on the thing. I don't know what that means. Um, hopefully it's good. But um, so we've been doing a lot of that. We've been doing a lot of text messaging with members and a lot of text banking. Um, what we're hearing from members is their main issues are pension and retirement. Uh, they're very concerned about their pension. They're very concerned about their retirement. So it took a lot of talking to members and reaching out to members, talking about exactly what kind of plan this administration has for them, for their pension plans, for their retirement plans. We're talking about how the tax on their the insurance tax on their pension is going to go up from $33 a month to over $400 a month and, and how that's going to affect them. Um, it also is two person crew for our brothers and sisters on the railroad. Uh, we're one half of our unions on the railroad. And for them, um, if Trump wins, it's going to be a death sentence for a lot of them for their jobs. Um, a lot of their jobs will be administered, will be eliminated. You're talking about two people on every crew right now, an engineer and a conductor. Well, you get rid of two-person crew legislation, there's no conductor. That removes a lot of conductors, um, a lot of conductor jobs. And the problem with that is when it comes to safety, uh, safety of local communities that people are, are traveling through, that these trains are traveling through and things like that. You look at the La Magentic explosion that happened a couple of years ago in Quebec. And when that occurred, a whole town got wiped out. And there was only one person on that train. There was no way they could administer that train. They left the train cab and that train started rolling away and there was nobody there to stop them. And that's what wanted to cause that explosion. And in town after town in rural America, in the United States, you have a lot of instances where if there's if a train crashes into an animal, train crashes into a car, or a train stops somewhere, it can block a, a community from one side of the community from the other. Which means one side of that community, whatever side doesn't have the hospital on it, is out of luck until that train moves. And when you have two people on the train, you can move that train out of the way. When you have one, that means somebody has to go and inspect the train, walk a mile, walk a mile back, and then move the train. So it has some real world um, causes, I mean, real world, world effects on local communities that are out there. Um, well, uh, yep. Chris, Chris has a, a comment for you or question. 
Well, just uh, Paul, you know, wearing your, uh, I see you're wearing your communications hat there. So, yeah. um, but no, you know, you're, you know, SMART is one of the few, you know, international unions that has its own podcast. And then of course, you know, Jeremy is you know, one of the locals, uh, they have a podcast and I'm just curious, you know, about the, the decision. Is this, is this part of your uh, plan to sort of push this down to the more local level because you know frankly from where this network stands it, it's it's pretty cutting edge uh, for international I'm just curious about how that's come apart because I know that can, there can be some hoops to jump through at yeah. your level yeah th there are quite a few but we've been lucky our leadership is very supportive of it um, we've got fantastic leadership here who's very forward-looking and a lot of it is when we talked about wanting to communicate directly from members and hear back from members, we wanted to use the podcast as a means of doing so. Because with the podcast, we feature members. We also feature member questions. Members always have questions, and one complaint members have had is, I can never hear back from the I never feel like I can ask the general president a question and get an answer. We've heard that in the past. But we want to make sure that members who have questions can ask the general president that question, can ask their local leadership that question, and know it will be taken seriously and it will be responded to. Because the only way we can, we can make this union stronger and the labor movement as a whole is when members feel like their input matters. Um, you want to be part of an organization that feels like, that makes you feel like you belong. You know, the three, what is it? The three, three most important needs every human being has is one is food, next one is shelter, and the third strongest one is a sense of belonging. And so we got to give people that sense of belonging, and let them feel like they want to belong and that we want them there. And doing that and having this opportunity for them to listen to what other members in the country are experiencing really makes them feel like they belong. And having a member ask the general president a question that everybody might be afraid to ask their business manager, be afraid to ask the general president. Well, there he is answering that question right there on the podcast. In that, as a listener, that's and, and as a member of the uh, international, that's my favorite part of the podcast because uh, the, the the one of my favorite things about General President Sellers is, I mean, he is he's an everyday guy, and when he does the uh, when he does the question and answer at the end, that comes off way better than some of the videos. I know the videos. I mean, they are what they are, and he has to do it, <laughs> but he's there's there's definitely more of a, a human touch. Yeah. to the, the Q&A section, and I, I really appreciate that. And, and to touch on your uh, uh, bringing the community in, I mean, I've seen that effect with what we're doing here. And, it, you know, it's not, it's, it's a local level, what we're doing, but it's having that same effect where it's, it's bringing a, a broad community in, in, in making it way more intimate. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think people being able to see those connections they have to other locals and seeing other locals have similar experiences or people... Like for us, especially, we were in a unique situation going into this years ago because we had a merger, a big merger back in 2012 that was culminated back then. So we had, at that point, it was two sides of a union that were not familiar with each other. And we had railroad people all of a sudden mixed in with construction people. And it was like, how do we find common ground? How do we bring people together and communicate and build that union, make it stronger rather than everybody just kind of go and do their own thing? And I think this election, we were able to, to mobilize a lot of our resources jointly, not as separate organizations, not as separate groups of people, but jointly. We had today uh, sheet metal members calling up TD members on the phone, getting them out to vote, and TD members calling up sheet, sheet metal workers on the phone, um, turning them out to vote. Same thing with the texting and everything else. And, as, and the more that we intermesh, the more you learn, it doesn't matter if you're a sheet metal worker or a laborer or an IVW member, machinist or a transportation member. We all go to the same bars. We all eat the same food. We all live the same lives. Our kids all go to the same schools. We're all in it together. And the more that we can get that out there to people and understand that not only are we in it together, but we're, we're part of each local community. For us, a lot of the focus was local. The biggest thing was local. President, oh, I was going to say, Paul, that's, I mean, it's really nice. I mean, I, I know President Stellars and I, I worked the tools just four years ago. Um, I went from working in a refinery to coming to, out to Washington, D.C. to lead this program. So I know what, you know, driving an hour and a half to work, 
means to make sure that you got a paycheck or, you know, those, those, you know, an hour commute in rural America for a sheet metal worker, a pipe fitter like myself, that's, that's a daily commute. And, and I think that there was this big lull, you know, we put the standard of excellence in, you know, back, you know, back, back 10 years ago, or, or, you know, before that, and we're pumping out these new apprentices. And I think one of the biggest things that we're poised to do, as, especially as a building trades, is to start to dig, dig back into our membership and, and engage our members, whichever way we can. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, targeting that podcast at five o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, you know, when folks are driving, you know, driving to work at seven o'clock. But it's something that, I, that I'm seeing that we're, we're finally getting the idea that we've got to go away from the idea of it's just a paycheck on Friday, but it's more that community feeling. It's more about, you know, making sure we're all coming together as, as union brothers and sisters. It, it, that's what, you know, I try to do with the AFLC. I always try and bring people from all the different backgrounds. You know, I'm not sure how many times I see myself in public with sheet metal workers, but, you know, as a pipe threader. But, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be able to do that, you know, and, and do it over common ground. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, I hate to interrupt here, guys, but we are coming up on about 10 minutes to the top of the hour, and I want to introduce somebody else who came on while you were talking. Uh, We've got David Story from the Valley Labor Report. Uh, David, you're in uh, where now? I'm in uh, North Alabama. And I believe your polls close in just about 10 minutes there in Alabama. Is that correct? That is correct. And I, I'm sitting here scrolling through everything I can find right now. I don't have a whole lot of information coming out of Alabama other than the fact that the uh, polling places have been absolutely packed all day long. Uh, I've seen uh, several videos and pictures from, from friends that generally in Alabama, we see long polling lines and traditionally minority uh, areas because they have done the Republicans in this state have done everything they can to uh, affect the those uh, minorities. So uh, we see long lines there, but I'm seeing lines where we've never seen lines before. So I expect a tremendous turnout tonight and probably a record-setting uh, amount of voters. Now, David, you're a uh, machinist, I understand, and I'm sure that you can identify with what Will and Paul are talking about here, about uh, people going out to work and and how we need to bring these members together so it's not just doing a job for a paycheck. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How's that fit in with the Valley Labor Report and what you're trying to do there? Yeah, I mean, basically, we're, uh, we, you know, uh, as everybody knows, we, uh, we're traditionally a red state over the past 20 years, and uh, politics, you know, I mean, I, I, not to throw a wet blanket on, on the party, but politics has a tendency to divide people, and especially divide people in our state, uh, and it, it, it it's, you know, uh, politics loves to use wedge issues. Uh, and so what we try to do on the Valley Labor Report is talk about bread and butter issues, things that affect people's paychecks. Uh, like Paul was saying earlier, build that solidarity between uh, our, our, our sisters, our brothers, people, the lesser of these, people that may have been forgotten, and let everybody know that... Uh, The union is more than just uh, a good paycheck. Uh, This this upcoming weekend, the Labor Council is putting on a uh, cookout. Hopefully, it's a celebratory cookout on Saturday. But, you know, we're inviting everybody to come out and just just, uh, enjoy the camaraderie of each other. You know, it's, it's it's very important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, there was time when that was sort of what unions were all about, is bringing people together and uh, everybody come down to the union hall because that's where we have our general area where we can do things like public meetings and bake sales and that kind of stuff. Will, yeah. Paul, it, it sounds like you guys have a drive to sort of reignite that in your trades. Am, am, I, am I reading that wrong? 
Yeah, we, we, we kind of need that. I, we, we definitely have a drive to do that. And it's not just within our trades, but overall, because when I was talking about the local level here, people are going to, it used to be what, in the 1950s, 1960s, if you had a community event, you did it at the Union Hall. The Union was a part of the pillar of the community locally. And then somewhere along the line, we kind of pulled back. And, then, and each trades hall became just for members of that trade. And it became this, everybody talks about the country club mentality. It's almost become cliche, but it became, oh, yeah, that's those people. They go there, right? Um, well, when you're not exposing yourself to the rest of the community, you're not really considered a part of the community. You're just those other people. And so we need to bring people in. We need to feel like there is some value from the labor movement to all these other unrepresented workers. It's more than just a paycheck. When we organized in our earliest days, in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s and 1930s, we didn't organize saying, okay, if you're this trade, then you'll be good, the rest of you are sorry. No, it was, we had a vision. There were communities, immigrant communities out there, Italians, Germans, Polish, Portuguese, whatever it may be, that came to the union because they knew that was a safe harbor. And today we don't have that, right? And, and, for lot, and lots of people right now are feeling disconnected, right? A lot of the people who fall for this right-wing stuff, this Trump stuff, they don't feel any connection to anything else. So they're going to go for that because they're being, they're being brought in. There's something cultural that they've got there. And we got to be able to appeal to people culturally. And it's exactly what's going on, what he's doing in Alabama, what brother's doing in Alabama, where you're having these picnics. Small things, like that. it may seem small, but it's not. People are now identifying with the organization. When you identify with the organization, you identify with the labor movement, you're more likely to defend it. When Scott Walker, when I was in Wisconsin 10 years ago, Scott Walker won. How he won, I really feel, was he played people off of each other. And it was these union people, these teachers, they have their share of the pie, and they're going to try to take your share of the pie. Don't worry about them. They're another part of society. They're another group that's out there rather than that being an attack on all working people. And so they play the divide and conquer. And until we can then get everybody to feel like they belong and they're a part of this, right? We're not gonna be able to really be on the, def on the offensive. It's the foundation of what we need moving into the future. And we're gonna need it now more than ever because this country's so divided, we gotta bring working people back together. No matter Amen, that, brother. And <clears throat> Will, you're actually taking one culture, which is the military, bringing veterans together and, and help them mesh that with another culture, right? You know, with, with before COVID, we had this kind of like theory of beer and barbecue, right? The idea was we have four pillars of our program, membership engagement, and we engage our members. We try and get them just to understand, right? If we're on a Zoom call like this or at a, at a, at a CLC, we've got veterans from every background in trades and in unions, but they're, they've got the same thing in their military career. So we've got these things in common. But I think the real point that I think that we're getting at is that membership engagement is important. We need to make sure we're reaching back in and organizing to organize. And we're, we have to realize that you know, this is a new, there's a big shift that's happening generationally. Um, there's a lot of young people starting to, to work in the, in the, starting to move up the ranks and, and talk about things. So when we start doing this membership engagement, we can't go back to bake sales. We have to, it's just like the veterans community. The traditional veteran organizations are falling apart, but we've got all these new ones, Team Rubicon, Team Red, Red, and Blue. Things are getting you active in the community. You know, the, this young generation of workers are active in their community. Um, they're in, you know, whether it's uh, in the Midwest, in baseball leagues, et cetera, right? So we have to meet them at their community. We have to make, meet them in their space, whether it's, you know, finding a way that we can explain to them all the things that are offered by labor, whether it's Union Sportsman Alliance, the Union Veterans Council, the different constituency groups, um, give them the tools and the platform to be in their community and, and, and do these kind of things. And that's what we've got to do. And I think that, you know, the communicating part of it, the telling the story part of it is, is really key. Um, and, and explaining to the, you know, our, our, our workers that we're all in it together, that, that, that we have similar stories. You know, I always remember hearing a story about organizing a plant where, you know, we're tr they were trying to get, you know, this big auto plant organized and they, they're trying to figure out how to get more people engaged. And they were trying to do football, football games on Friday or football games on Sunday at a sports bar. 
but 90% of the members were um, North African um, um, immigrants, um, refugees, and they didn't watch American football and they didn't drink. So what they did was they, they, they rented out a, 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 a tea and soccer place and it was packed and that, that was the best, best move they made. So we've got to meet our members at their, at their table. We got to figure out ways to make them understand that, 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 that there is a community and we got to think outside the box. That's the, that's the most important thing. Thanks, Will, and thanks, Paul. Thanks to you both. Uh, this is a great reports, uh, and I, I didn't realize there were so many interconnections there. So that's uh, really cool. Uh, Paul, keep up the great work. We're really excited. Uh, Jeremy has been kicking ass, you know, <laughs> as, 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 as you know, yep. uh, and we're really excited to see that. Uh, also, I know. Uh, uh, Michael Blaine would have been would have been here. He's actually up in um, uh, uh, Carol's neck of the woods right now. Uh, yeah. But uh, the the smart podcast is is uh, we, I was telling um, Jeremy earlier the uh, the intro with the sound of the sheet metal uh, working is is a definitely distinctive sound. Really love that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike 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 put a lot into that as well. Mike does a lot of the technical stuff on that. And he is a genius. He started off a year ago. He was, he, he came on part time. Now he's full time. He's full staff, and he's a very, very valuable member of the staff. And you know, and you see what kind of people we have out there. You got Jeremy. We got a whole bunch of guys like him. And this union's, you know, I'm really looking forward to the future because of guys like him. All right. Thanks for being on the show, Will. Always great to have you on, brother. Keep up the great work. All right. Definitely. Anytime. Thanks so much.